palliative care center um, of excellence for um, this opportunity. Robin and I um, envisioned this as a workshop originally, but um, post COVID we've reworked it to be a didactic mm -hmm. session and we're excited for to be with you today. It's a real honor. Um, the inpatient consult team at St. Peter Hospital in Olympia, Washington was started 15 years ago. And at its inception, it consisted of a part-time physician, Dr. Greg Van de Kieft and a nurse. Um, I joined the team about a year later and I was the third member to join the team. <clears throat> We're now a team of over 30 people and we cover inpatient consult services at two different hospitals and an outpatient clinic. As you can imagine, there's been a tremendous amount of growth over the years. And um, today we're gonna share with you a toolkit of the processes and tools that we have developed to adapt to the growth and to be able to um, remain uh, optimally and highly functional as an interdisciplinary team. Um, the tools and processes are unique to our team and every team of course has its own culture and challenges. Um, so nobody's going to be able to take what we've created and use it without modifications, but we do hope that you'll find some ideas and some pearls, um, maybe be able to use some of our documents mm -hmm. as a, a starting point to build off of. And Robin, did you want to? And I joined the team about eight years ago, and I was the seventh person to join at that time. Um, and we also wanted to um, acknowledge the contributions of mm -hmm. the director of our program, Sherry Cahey. She was not able to be with us today, but and, um, she did help us prepare for this presentation. And she was very um, instrumental in creating some of the processes and tools that we're gonna share with you today. And in addition, we want to acknowledge the contributions of everyone on our team um, and their were our people, even a few people that are no longer on our team that really contributed a lot. It was truly a collaborative effort. Um, so Robin, do you wanna share your screen? Um, put this slide okay. on. Okay, yeah, I thought I was sharing. <laughs> so we have no um, relevant financial relationships with any commercial interests. So we wanted to share that disclosure with you. And um, we, we're gonna start with actually with a poll. We just wanted to do these briefly to um, first see, we just wanted to get a sense of who's our audience today. So um, please check off your discipline on the poll so we can just get a sense of who we have in the audience here. I'm giving you a couple seconds to do that. Okay, so it looks like we have about 80% nurses, 75 to 80% nurses, um, and then a few other disciplines as well. I'm gonna go ahead and end that one. And then we wanted to um, also ask if you, wait a second, this is the wrong poll, so hold on one second. Um, um, Sarah, the, the two polls actually, uh, the two questions show up together. So the, oh, got it. they have responded okay. below. Oh, so people already respond. Terrific. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay. So, oh, so 75% of people are not a member of a palliative care team. 25% are. So we um, designed this um, to uh, help palliative care teams, but I think that so much of it will be relevant to any interdisciplinary team. Um, so thank you for that. And then in terms of um, the overview um, for today, we're gonna start with a reflection. Then Robin and I will introduce the tools that we've been, that we created. Um, then we're gonna give you a little bit of time for some self work. And Robin, I don't know if you're aware, I'm still, you're still on the disclosures. Yeah, there we go, okay. And then we'll hear from um, those of you in the audience um, to, to do some reflecting and sharing, and then we'll have questions and discussion at the end. Um, okay. So um, as I mentioned, we started out small. We've had a, a terrific amount of growth, which I think is typical of most palliative care teams. Um, 
And as we grew, communication became exponentially more complicated because now we had people from a lot of different disciplines and we all needed to talk to each other about patient care. Um, and not only did we come from different disciplines, but also, you know, just individuals have different styles and um, approaches. And so sometimes this led to conflict. And one thing we discovered is that although as a palliative care team, we all shared the same, um, the same vision, our disciplines each had their own culture and values and norms for communication and for documenting. And we needed to address this in order and give this some attention in order for us to function well as an interdisciplinary team. So when we started out, our really small group was able to function well without workflows and guidelines. But um, as we grew, it became apparent that we had a, a need for more standardization. And I'll give you an example um, from my perspective as a physician, um, as our team grew, my days were increasingly peppered with interruptions or um, calls from other people on my team who wanted to check in with me about a patient's care. And sometimes I found these conversations long-winded, um, very narrative, and it was hard for me to figure out um, what they were asking of me, or even if they were asking something or just sharing their observations and feelings. And, you know, a, a couple of these interactions in a day I loved because I liked the connection, but um, as it happened more and more, um, it took a lot of time and I found it frustrating. And for me, I recognized that there was significant variation in how different providers held goals of care discussions, and I worried things were being missed. For example, some clinicians would start talking to patients about preferences for medical care without exploring what the patient even knew about their condition and what they might expect in the days and weeks to come. And I was concerned best practices were not always being followed. So we wondered, um, you know, in our field, there were and are rapid advances in best practices. We wondered how we could keep up as a group um, and minimize variation in the delivery of care from one consult to the next. Um, when, when Greg and I were the only providers, we had very similar practice styles. It was easy for us to seamlessly sign patients out to one another. And when one of us went to a conference and learned something new, we would just update the other one. But as our team grew, that, that became more complex. So eventually, um, we, Robin and I both saw the need for standardized processes and structure. Um, Robin did have to convince me because, um, again, as a physician, um, the physician culture is very much about functioning as an individual. And I, I felt that my value was really a lot about my judgment. And I wanted to have the flexibility to use my judgment in any given situation. And so the idea of having a lot of policies and processes just didn't resonate with me. So just think for a minute about how we communicate with other people on our team. There's so many different things, different tasks that we need to accomplish through our communication. There's logistical things like handing off patients to one another, sharing the work, um, making patient assignments as new consults roll in, and then prepping for and debriefing after family meetings or care conferences. And then there's more creative communication like problem solving and um, sharing ideas, brainstorming. You know, as a team grows, there's opportunities to try new um, projects and programs. And then there's more nuanced and skilled communication that needs to take place um, in addressing conflict, which of course is inevitable on a team. Um, teaching, mentoring, coaching, and helping each other learn and grow. And also as we have students and residents and new people joining our team, there's a lot of that that needs to happen. And then providing feedback and depending on your position, you may need to do more or less of that. And then there's the tender and vulnerable communication where we look to each other for emotional support and on, want to have a, a way of honoring the deceased. So we're gonna do another poll. Um, Think about how you work with other people on your team. And you're not gonna have to share this with anybody, so be honest with yourself, but are there particular people that you really enjoy communicating with and others that 
that you might find it frustrating? Um, are there specific situations that are challenging? Um, so think about that. And then I'm going to launch this poll. Um, this one, no, <laughs> this one. Yeah. Um, so uh, what frustrates me, me being you, what frustrates me most regarding communication with others on my team? When someone provides too much extra information, it's difficult to know what they're telling me. When they're curt or rude, when someone doesn't seem to value my input or my opinion, when someone seems bossy and tells me what to do, when someone's timid or too hesitant and it's difficult to know what they need or what they're thinking, um, someone's doing too much emotional processing out loud, someone's obviously affected by their emotions, but they don't seem to see or acknowledge that or something else. And don't overthink this. We just wanted to kind of get you thinking about um, where, you, where you are challenged. So give you a couple more <coughs> seconds to answer the poll. It looks like 18, 20 out of 30 have voted. So we'll give you a couple more minutes. And again, um, don't, don't worry if, if you can't decide or if the perfect answer isn't there. Okay, so we've got 25 out of 30 voted. So I'm going to um, end the poll and share the results. Okay, so um, I hope people can see this. Um, so it looks like kind of a spread of responses the most if someone's curt or rude. And then a lot of people said when it seems like their input or their opinions not valued. Um, and then also a few for um, someone's obviously affected by their emotions, but not seeing that or acknowledging it. And someone providing too much extra information, difficult to know what they're telling me. So, mm -hmm. Great, thank you for that. <coughs> okay, so just keep this in mind as we um, move uh, through the, the tools and the processes that we're gonna share with you. So on to, off to you, Robin. So with our growth came growing pains. Um, as our need for more staffing increased, we ended up hiring people who didn't necessarily have experience in palliative care, and we had not yet developed an orientation or training program to mentor these individuals. And there was a lot of variation in the work, especially around goals of care conversations. There was also resistance to change from our original group. People continued to kind of want to function independently, some wanted to be lone wolves, and we struggled to work together as a cohesive team. We hired key clinicians, which are typically included in a high-functioning team for palliative care, including MSW, RN, chaplain, but we still weren't functioning at a high level because there was a lot of confusion about our roles and scope of practice. So we recognized our next steps were to define roles, define scope of practices, create standardized guidelines, and implement daily workflow processes. At the same time, there are opportunities. There was a lot of work being done within our health system, for example, developing processes in EPIC to be able to document goals of care conversations that would easily carry from one admission to another. And another example is our system secured a contract with ACP decision videos, which is an evidence-based decision tool to improve informed decision-making. And this really provided us an opportunity to think more about processes. So I'm gonna review some of our daily processes. We developed an inpatient service workflow to set clear expectations in order to reduce that variation in work that we were doing and in the services we were providing to our patients and our referring providers. This is the example of the guidelines in patient service workflow. You all have a copy of this and it describes in detail. Um, it's gonna be three pages long when you see it. So I'm not gonna go through all the details. It does include eight essential components for a palliative care consult. Um, and I'm gonna just review these. We wanted to make sure that um, we always look for evidence of previous advanced care planning, that we address symptom management, that we followed our evidence-based communication frameworks, that we were documenting patient and family wishes, 
and that we were collaborating with our multidisciplinary clinicians, including the case manager, our consulting providers, the floor nurses, and therapies as needed, and also providing emotional and spiritual support. In order to keep our service census at a reasonable number, we recognize the need to sign off on patients with longer lengths of stay. And when we had completed the eight essential components of the consult, it could be time to sign off. And we found the need for this because a lot of times team members would become attached and wanted to continue to see a family or patient, but also sometimes referring providers would want us to take over a care of long length of stay patients. The sign off guidelines helps us make sure we completed everything we need to for a thorough consult. We also recognize the need for one individual to manage the daily consult service. So we established the triage nurse role. This person does not try to see patients. They have an extensive list of responsibilities, including preparing and running morning huddle, managing and updating the EPIC patient list, preparing and preparing the daily assignment sheet, screening new consults and balancing the provider loads, assigning social work and spiritual care as needed, organizing family meetings and keeping track of what's left completed in a um, consult and preparing for follow-up visits. Since we created this position, we wonder how we ever thought we could function without it. This is an example of the triage nurse responsibilities and workflow. Very specific, very detailed, and it's five pages long. And again, you have a copy of this. <clears throat> the EPIC patient list is managed by the triage nurse. Um, they provide foundational information. And this is essentially how we provide report to each other. We're able to track the trajectory of the consult based on what's been done and what still needs to be done. For example, it alerts the team if a pulse has been completed or still is needed. And it helps prevent patients from getting lost. When our census is high and we aren't seeing the patient daily, maybe we're watching for clinical trajectory or waiting for a test result. It also addresses decisional capacity of the patient. Do we need the legal healthcare surrogate? Um, I highlighted the goals of care note um, and it's kept that making sure it's captured in EPIC, it's part of our quality metric. I also highlighted the ACP decision video, would the patient benefit from that? And we have other issues, would the patient benefit from an outpatient palliative care consult? Ideally, the provider fills in the gaps for the information immediately after each visit or before the end of the day. And if not, they're al alerting the triage nurse. <clears throat> the daily assignment sheet is created each morning by the triage nurse and it creates the team makeup for the day. The nurse assigns providers to follow-ups based on continuity of care and new consults based on acuity, which is really challenging and indicate what are the tasks for that day. Um, and is there a care conference? Should it include other team members like social work or chaplain? And the second half of the form is for managing billing. It reminds um, the providers to enter appropriate billing. And we also share this information with our case managers. The triage nurse sets a calm intention for the day. Creating an organized process flow for morning huddle was a game changer. We needed to set boundaries around long drawn out morning discussions that in the past had been used to debrief complex and emotional cases. So now the triage nurse begins with reflection, introduces new students, residents, caregivers, allows dis announces discharges and deaths and allows time for silence to honor the deceased or brief reflection about the patient. Then provides a brief report about each patient, what's needed, which clinician is assigned to each patient, reviews any outside meeting and closes. We get all of this done within 30 minutes. And now I'm gonna hand it over back to you, Sarah. Okay, <laughs> so Karen Dreams is our team's framework for structuring goals of care conversations. And this is something that Robin and I wrote, but we drew heavily from a lot of different um, resources. 
Um, we built this off of REMAP, which is Vital Talks, Talking Map for Late Goals of Care Conversations. Um, Robin and I are both uh, trained Vital Talk faculty. And Robin and I also are faculty with the Institute of Human Caring and went through their training, um, Providence's communication training, advanced communication training, which is um, built off of the Serious Illness Conversation Guide. Before that, Robin and I both had some training from Respecting Choices. And um, before that, we used Spikes, which is a mnemonic for breaking difficult news. So all of those um, resources uh, are, are um, represented here in Karen Dreams. So the purpose of this document was to or is to um, reduce variation, um, also help our efficiency by reminding us to go in a particular order. Um, we had many examples or instances of um, having a pretty long goals of care conversation with somebody and then, then like late in the conversation realizing they're probably not decisional because of some mild dementia or delirium. Um, or you know, thinking that you're talking to the appropriate family member, but then finding out that they're not the actual power of attorney. So this helps remind us to check those things at the beginning. Um, we also um, wanted to have a framework that we could refer to in handing off care between members of the team. Because as you know, goals of care conversations, um, that consult isn't, or it's pretty rare that it's a kind of one time, one and done in a, di in a single day. And so um, we can refer to this framework and say like, I got to the letter E <laughs> and you'll need to pick up there tomorrow or the next time that the family comes mm -hmm. together for a meeting. Um, another thing is that we noticed um, there's a lot of variation in the, amount and the type of training that people come to come with when they join our team. So the physicians that have joined our team recently have been fellowship trained and they've had an entire year of palliative care education and they have been trained in frameworks for having goals of care conversations. While many of the nurse practitioners that we've hired might have a lot of experience but not palliative care experience. And so we're kind of having to figure out how to provide training um, to them um, specific to palliative care and goals of care conversations. And similarly with the social workers and chaplains that have joined our team and nurses that um, they have, they may have like really rich um, background that's very relevant, but they might not have specific palliative care training. And social workers and chaplains have this really rich communication training, but not necessarily goals of care for palliative care context. Um, so this is, is this is kind of helps um, anchor us all in the same map. And, um, and then you'll see that also, um, we use this to kind of remind us to think about the advanced care planning videos that we have access to, um, to remind us that there may be points during this conversation that we could utilize those videos. So the care part of Care and Dreams is about um, introducing the team, establishing rapport and trust, finding out um, who the power of attorney is and determining whether the patient is decisional, whether they want to have a conversation by themselves, whether maybe they would prefer to have family there with them or whether they need to have um, someone who can be their decision maker with them. Do they need a hearing aid? Um, do they need an interpreter? Um, all those things that need to happen before we actually have a rich conversation and then the, the E part of care is eliciting the patient's story. And this is finding out what, what is their functional status? What's the story of their illness? Um, how has it impacted their life? What do they know about their illness or their medical situation? And do they have any idea of what to expect looking forward? <clears throat> the care part of care and dreams can be done by any, anybody on our team. Um, the dreams part of care and dreams, the DR, deliver the medical message, expect and respond to emotion. Um, we like to have a provider do the delivering medical message for that first um, time. But that doesn't mean that this isn't relevant to all the disciplines on our team because um, certainly 
social worker, chaplain, nurse can reinforce um, a prognosis that's already been discussed with the patient and the family. And they may talk about um, prognosis more in terms of functional status. For example, um, I'm concerned that this may be as strong as you'll get. So, um, so this uh, is about delivering the medical message, um, responding to emotion, and then exploring values. And um, this E, eliciting patients' values, preference, and priorities is different than the E of care, eliciting the patient's story, because um, we've also, over the years, made missteps where we started asking people about what's most important to you when you think about the time ahead, you know, what, what gives your life meaning? Um, what do you hope for? What are your fears and worries? And if that patient or family doesn't have a clear idea of the prognosis, sometimes that can really backfire because um, they're thinking that possibilities are open to them that actually are not or vice versa. And then uh, aligning with those priorities and wishes, then making a plan that is in the context of that patient's values and then summarizing. Um, so that is the Care and Dreams document. Um, then uh, next slide. So family meetings, we have the expectation that if more than one person from our team is gonna be in a family meeting that we will pre-meet and debrief. And we have created a structure for this to keep it brief and efficient. Um, the pre-meet is really about one kind of setting the agenda what are we hoping to accomplish in this meeting? And then deciding who's gonna do what role in the meeting. And this is a beautiful opportunity to work with our learners. So if we have students or residents, we can check in with them, find out what part of the goals of care conversation or what part of the consult they would like to work on and give them a single task or a single part of the conversation to try. Um, it's also, it's not just for students and residents, but when we're onboarding new people onto our team, this is a good time to um, kind of use that same idea of finding out where they need practice or what they'd like to try and then being able to give them feedback. And then for those of us that have been doing this for many years, it's still an opportunity to have uh, feed, get feedback from a peer. And then the debrief, um, we borrowed this format from Vital Talk. Um, starting with how did that go? And then what went well? Because we so often forget to think about that. Um, what did you do well or what did we do well? And then what might we have done differently? So an opportunity to, to learn something. Um, and then negotiating the work that needs to happen after the family meeting. So who's gonna go talk to the case manager or the patient's nurse or the attending and document and all the pieces that need to happen after the family meeting. I'll just add that um, in the debrief, I learned something from the chaplains on our team about um, asking, how did this patient or family impact me? And that's a routine part of a chaplain's assessment of a patient encounter. It's not something that I was ever taught. And I think it's crucial to um, building resilience. It doesn't need to take a lot of time, but it's um, important to pause and think about that. Uh, next slide. So this is SBAR, and this may be very familiar to many of you. Um, the purpose of this is to give a structure for efficiently and concisely asking each other for help and um, to collaborate. Um, we use this within our team, but we also use it when we're communicating with people outside of our team and in particular with physicians, because this really follows the format that the doctors are trained to, to um, communicate with each other in this order. So the S is the situation, what's going on now? Um, and for example, on our team, it might look like... Um, Hey, Sarah, I'm calling you about Martha Magoo in room 2040. I think it's time to transition to a morphine infusion, and I'm hoping that maybe you could put in that order. And then background would be, she is our 78-year-old woman with metastatic breast cancer. 
She has painful bony mats. She is on comfort care and she's been comfortable with just a few doses of IV morphine a day, but last night she got more restless and she's requiring now morphine boluses every few hours. Assessment, I think a morphine infusion would help even out the pain management and keep her more comfortable. And um, I checked in with her nurse and her family and they're on board with that. They agree if, if that's what you decide to do. And then recommendation, would you feel comfortable putting in that order? And next slide. Okay, so to recap the tools and processes that we use on a daily basis, to foster good interdisciplinary team communication and collaboration are the inpatient service workflow, which clarifies team expectations and helps reduce variation in our work, a sign-off policy for keeping our census manageable, triage RN and workflow for managing the daily processes and managing the patient list, and the EPIC patient list for patient handoffs and giving report, the daily assignment sheet, which helps the triage nurse keep track of who's been assigned to which patient on a given day, and also um, helps us with billing integrity. The Care and Dreams framework, which helps us um, be consistent in our goals of care consult um, conversations and helps us communicate with each other about where we are in the consult. Pre-meeting and debriefing around palliative care goals of care conferences. And this is um, a, a key opportunity to learn from each other and to help support coach and mentor new people on our team and students and residents. And then SBAR for multidisciplinary communication. And this is in particular um, the way that providers are trained to listen for um, patient information. So now we're going to shift gears and share with you some of the tools and processes that we use on a weekly and annual basis. Um, so Wednesday meetings, <clears throat> um, long ago we had Wednesday lunch meetings, but um, we would often cancel them. We would just kind of see what the day looked like, but if it was busy, um, we would we would often cancel the meeting and, um, and people would come late because they'd get caught up in um, family meetings and, and other work. So at some point we said, you know, we need to have a time that we all come together and it's just a, make it a priority. And so now we have Wednesday meetings from 1230 to 130 every single Wednesday. It's rarely canceled. Um, we start on time, we end on time, and everyone that's here seeing patients and in inpatient setting that day is expected to come. People do end up coming a little late sometimes um, because of patient care, but we, we try to make it a real priority to be here at the meeting. And the expectation is that people will eat lunch during the meeting, that's perfectly acceptable. Um, and so the way we have it structured is the first Wednesday of the month is staff meeting. And the purpose of staff meeting is for sharing information and also for team discussion if there are decisions that we need to make as a team. We provide strategic plan updates quarterly at these meetings to just check in with um, how are we um, doing in terms of um, achieving or working towards um, what's on our strategic plan. And um, it's a chance for people that are on committees or working on projects to share with the team um, any information that they uh, would need to know. And then we try to build in time for round table, which is a chance for people to just share a personal tidbit about their, um, what's going on in their life so that we can kind of uh, um, support each other as a team in that format. The second and the fourth Wednesdays of the month are interdisciplinary team meetings. And so we, we bring complex cases to these meetings and get the interdisciplinary perspective on, um, on those cases. So we typically troll for cases a day or two before these IDT meetings to, to sort of remind each other like, oh yeah, yeah, that was a good case or, and figure out who's, who's gonna be able to present that patient to the team. And then the um, fifth Wednesday, which happens four times a year are our resilience Wednesdays. 
And so the intention of the Resilience Wednesday is to come together as a team and tend to our, um, to be intentional as a team around our team health and to also communicate um, how vitally important it is to take care of ourselves, to tend to our resilience, to share ideas and learn from each other about um, how we deal with some of the um, high emotion and stress of the job. I want to share some examples. So um, for education, it could be internal or external. So sometimes it's someone on our team sharing um, something that they've learned at a conference or some, something that they've prepared, or it could be somebody external to the team. So for example, in the last six months or so, we had a radiation oncologist come. We had the coordinator of the TAVR program here talk to us, someone from organ donation talk to our team, and we had a uh, Someone from legal in the hospital talked to us about surrogacy issues and questions around that. And then some examples of what we've done for resilience. Um, the chaplain on our team led us in talking about children's books and what our favorite books were um, and kind of tapped into some themes from there. That was one session. And on another session, one of the nurse practitioners on our team, who's also a published poet, um, talked to us about um, writing and we wrote 55 word stories just right then and there in that hour session and shared them with each other. Next slide. Um, so the team assessment tool is something that um, we found on CAPSI's website. They have a monograph called Strategies for Maximizing the Health and Function of Palliative Care Teams. And embedded in that document is this team assessment tool. There's lots of different tools. There's nothing I think particularly special about this tool, but um, we have found it valuable to administer this tool once or twice a year to kind of take the temperature of the team. And it's an opportunity to celebrate what we're doing well together as a team. And it's also an opportunity to highlight if there are areas of opportunity where we can do a better job. Next slide. So we started doing a team retreat once a year, several years ago. And the first few times we were able to kind of close the service and have the whole team there, but now we've gotten big enough that that's not really feasible. So recently we've been dividing the team in half and we kind of have a skeleton crew cover the service while um, the other half of the team goes on a retreat and then we flip flop. And at the retreats, we spend about half the day just um, having a walk in the woods, playing funny games, sharing a meal. Um, and then about half the day, we do um, some type of a workout. So um, on one of the first retreats that we did, we compared and contrasted our disciplines. We shared with each other what our training was like and then what the... Um, values, norms, and traditions are in each of our disciplines. And it was really interesting because they're quite different and um, it definitely affects the way that people show up on the team. And um, another uh, year we did the Enneagram, which was useful for exploring um, individual styles of communication. And it helped us also recognize that we have a style of communication as a team. And um, this was good for appreciating that we all have different strengths in the way that we approach communication and inviting introspection um, for each of us to think about and, and develop some curiosity about maybe trying some different approaches. So I would say that the retreats are certainly a big investment of time and money, but hugely valuable in terms of um, building team um, camaraderie and also helping us work through some challenges. Uh, next slide. The annual goals of care class is something that Robin and I um, develop. We, we change it. We have a different um, curriculum every year and we've been doing this now for probably five or six years. Um, the, uh, this year we have our team divided in four different groups that range from six to 10 people. And um, 
what it is, what the goals of care classes are, is an opportunity to practice communication because the best way to get better at communication is to practice. And so we have often used the vital talk model of facilitated role play and had actor patients and actually done a lot of role play and practice and having conversations with patients. Um, we've also um, asked around the team to see where their points of tension were and where they had communication challenges. And we've done some drills and role play in communicating with each other and also with our referring providers. So some examples are like um, when you get a call from a provider who wants you to see a patient because quote unquote, they should be DNR. And then you talk to the patient and the family and there's no way. <laughs> and you have to go back and talk to the attending. It's full code, full treatment. And sometimes they might be really disappointed. And um, so that can be a challenging conversation. So we, we kind of brainstormed ways to respond to that and practice that. Um, also, like even within our team, like it's hard to be the triage nurse because when, when you can see that everyone else on the team is scrambling and they're busy and the consults keep rolling in and you have to call people up and tell them, yeah, I've got another one for you. Um, and people, of course, respond to that differently. And so the, <laughs> the triage nurse takes a lot, um, kind of absorbs a lot of people's emotional energy around that. So those are the kinds of things that we have built into um, these goals of care classes. Um, oh, and what, one other thing I want to say about this is it's good when we're onboarding new team members um, because this also is a chance to just help them kind of figure out the tools that we're using and the, the, goal, the care and dreams and things like that. So next slide. Um, we work really hard to maintain a culture of safety on the team. And what that looks like really is um, trying very hard not to take our conflicts um, in the, you know, into the dark and kind of talk with someone else on the team about how your frustration, but to, to have direct communication with each other um, when there's an issue. And so usually this is as simple as, you know, if you're listening to somebody's complaint or frustration, just asking them, have you talked to the person that they're having conflict with? And if not, then what would it look like to talk to them about it? And then maybe helping that person come up with the words and the courage to go have that conversation. And um, it's amazing how with, as you build um, successes with that, how the trust builds that this is how the leadership of the team is gonna handle conflict. And this is how as a team, we like to approach things. And I, I will say that we are not perfect. And um, this does take a lot of intention um, a lot of practice and um, uh, it's something that we're always striving for. Next slide. So to recap um, the tools and processes that we use on a weekly and annual basis to help us have really, um, really great interdisciplinary team communication and collaboration are the team assessment, which helps us screen for problems and also celebrate what's going well. The Wednesday meetings, sharing information, team discussions, interdisciplinary team um, to learn uh, from complex cases, education and addressing um, ways to build our resilience, maintain resilience. Um, the retreats for building the team and for um, team workouts the annual goes of care training to help us keep up with best practices and continue to develop our skills in communication, onboard new team members. And these um, goals of care classes also uh, coincident coincidentally help with team building as well, because they're usually quite fun and we have some really great conversations. And then um, trying to foster a culture of safety. Next slide. So um, let me just check the time. Yeah, so we have about 15 minutes. We may not need that long, but um, this is a chance for you to think back to that poll and that reflection at the beginning of the session where you are challenged in communicating with a team member, um, or you could think more broadly about your team as a whole, the um, conflicts that you observe. 
And then think through the tools and the processes that we have shared with you today and think about whether there's a particular one or maybe several that you might bring back to your team that would help you address your communication challenges. Um, so write, write it down and then um, we would love for people to post maybe one thing. You don't have to write everything that you're thinking, but post one thing in the chat that you're gonna take forward. Don't be shy, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Alice. I, yeah, I don't, I don't know if, um, I imagine people might need some time to think and look at the tools, but, um, but yeah, go ahead and post as soon as you have an idea. I'm gonna have you read the chat, Sarah. Okay. Yeah, so we hear, someone says, um, the pre-meeting and debriefing is definitely something I will encourage our teams to use. Great. I know it might, I'm curious, like, um, cause that initial poll, it sounded like 75% of people on the call are not actually on palliative care teams. So if you're not on a palliative care team, then just um, put something in the chat, let us know uh, what your interest in the talk was or what your role is. And if there's anything that you feel that you'll be able to take, take back to your team or take forward in your work. I'm curious if other teams have encountered the same kinds of challenges that we did along the way as we grew. So I would, I might invite people. Um, oh, and Alice says we have until two fifteen. Okay. Um, we, uh, well, I'd like to invite people to share um, orally. We, we were, weren't sure how, um, if that would um, get out of control, but I don't think it's going to get out of control. So um, anyone that wants to unmute themselves and share your thoughts with the group, that would be great. Um, so one person said this conference is not just for the palliative care team, I thought. And then um, increased number of NICU parents with various social issues that are affecting care of their children, looking to improve a way of handling such relationships. Um, I'll be returning to work, ready to sit with a team member that I've had curt conversations with and resolve our conflict. That's great. So um, let's see, increased numbers of NICU parents with various social issues that are affecting care of their children. Yeah, those um, sound like very challenging conversations. Um, I know for myself, I have found Vital Talk such a great uh, resource in terms of um, learning to look for emotion and respond to that emotion. And I don't know if that is something you've had an opportunity to, um, a course that you've had an opportunity to take, but um, it seems like that would be really helpful for these types of really challenging conversations.
what other thoughts do people have? We will just open it up to um, questions. Any any questions or discussion um, at this point? Um, Sarah, I actually would love to hear a little bit more about what your team does at these retreats. Um, I, you talked a little bit about that, but um, just would like to hear more about what you find to be most helpful. Um, yes. Yeah, sure. Yeah, great question. Um, you know, I, kind of interestingly, um, I think probably the best thing about the retreats, at least from my perspective, are the silly games that we've done. It's not, it's not my style. It's not something I ever would have thought to try, but, um, but other people on the team um, had that idea and they uh, always come up with some, um, you know, active, like we're moving around the room, we're trying to knock down water bottles by rolling something across the floor. Um, those kinds of activities where we're, um, we're interacting with each other, where we're laughing and it's completely different from what we do every day at work. Um, and I think that has been just tremendous in terms of team building. I mean, you see a side of people that you don't, wouldn't otherwise see and just having fun together. I guess it's kind of similar to like a marriage or a relationship where it's just so crucial to do things, to have fun together. Um, Robin, what would you say? I agree with that. And I think, um, you know, there's always really um, healthy, good food and sitting together for a meal is awesome. And really just that relaxation that, okay, we're not working today. And the things that we do are are really to help build our resilience. It's it's been super helpful. Yeah. The um so the Enneagram project that we did that was at our most recent retreat when we were able to all be together physically because of course during COVID we weren't able to do that, but um we actually had um, somebody come uh, a guest and we took a um, quiz ahead of time that we had to answer all kinds of questions about how we communicate. And then we were sort of assigned a, a type. And then she divided us into groups where we sat with other people from the same type of communication style. And it was really funny. It's really interesting to talk to other people at your table and just recognize that you respond to stress in the same way. And then, um, and then sort of, it, as we shared with the group um, about the, the different styles. And of course that got us all laughing. And, um, and then we've continued to kind of think about that as um, when it's time to make a decision as a team or um, when there is conflict to, um, to kind of wonder aloud maybe how our approach to communication might be impacting us and, and thinking about if there might be a different approach that we could take that might work. Um, so, yeah, uh, yeah. somebody to listen to me, I look for the nines on our group, so. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of um, people that are kind of peacemakers and pre prefer uh, to avoid conflict if at all possible. Um, so I, someone else on our team is um, saying uh, being able to play and laugh together is so important. Um, so yeah, I think that's, um, I'm also seeing in the chat, somebody says, I hope to make a move to palliative care nursing in the next year. The systems you have in place are excellent. In my current workplace, there are a few 
regular, there are few regular staff meetings and no debriefings. Mm -hmm. I plan to bring your information back to see if we can get more regular meetings scheduled. So much value in these, I think. Yes, I agree with that and thank you for that. Um, and any other um, questions or wonders people have? I think we have been fortunate um, that uh, we have leaders that, that um, value this and have been willing to invest in the retreats and the goals of care classes um, because um, like I said, I wouldn't have necessarily known how valuable they are until having experienced that. I'm wondering for, for teams where the leadership isn't um, maybe as knowledgeable or supportive of things like this, um, is there anything you would recommend to kind of push them? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think that um, I mentioned the team assessment that I, that I pulled from the CAPC monograph um, let me just see what that was called again. It's like strategies for maximizing effectiveness of palliative care teams. And um, I actually went to our leader with, with that document and said, I think we are doing a lot of these things, but I think there's more that we could do. And she read it and she said, yeah, I agree. Let's, let's think about this. So I think that if you you know can take that document and show it to leadership, that's um, that's really helpful because that's of course bigger than just your institution. Um, so that would be one strategy, and then um, maybe if you can you know really uh, think about how whatever challenges you're facing in terms of um, communication challenges are impacting the team then you could make the case for how, you know, if we, if we could achieve um, smoother communication, then this, that, and the other would fall into place and we could be that much more efficient and effective in our work. I think it's also helpful if you can, you know, if you're, if you're thinking of proposing a specific approach like doing a team retreat, then coming with an actual proposal with a budget is helpful too. So doing a little legwork on what, what it is you're proposing and what it might look like at least gives you a place to start. And one other thing I thought I would add is um, ITHS, well, for, for those of us at the UW, ITHS has a um, team communication workshop. It's free. I believe it's held once a year. If you sign up for their emails, you will get the invite. Um, I've done it a couple of times, and it was really, really nice to do some of these activities in a very structured environment with other teams, uh, both clinical and, and research. That's really cool. What other questions do people have or, or um, things to share? Robin, what was it like um, trying to convince the team that we needed to adopt some of the processes and the structure? That was probably the most challenging. That was um, that was that was tough because uh, a lot of people don't necessarily like change, um, and then helping people to see that this the change could be good. It could make things better, more efficient, easier. It was, it was definitely really challenging. Um, and it was just like, keep nudging, keep nudging. And uh, yeah. <laughs> A lot of patience. A lot of patience. When, when did you implement all these policies? Or has it been a gradual process? It almost also sounds like everything's in place now. And yeah. have people readily accepted it? Yeah. 
yeah, I would say, yes, it was, it's been a gradual process. So it wasn't like we, you know, uh, developed them and presented them all at once. It's everything sort of came out of some, some problem we were having or some challenge we were having. So then kind of brainstorming and thinking about how can we address this and, um, and then it, it gets easier because now, of course, as new people join the team, we just start off with, you know, this is how we do things. Exactly. And this is, yeah. 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 It's definitely easier to onboard people with set processes than to have people that have been doing something that way for a, a certain way for a long time and, and bring them along. That was more, definitely more challenging. It took longer. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah so and Oh, go ahead. No, so um, I know that when you mentioned, so I'm the nurse that is actually hoping to move into palliative or end of life work uh, in the next um, year or so. Um, I worked labor and delivery for 25 years, was quite active. Oh, nice. <laughs> With um, uh, uh, um, uh, fetal demises and, and newborn deaths. So I was always on those committees and have, um, had training as a end of life doula. And um, so, and you mentioned that you have staff that may or may not, that have rich experiences, but. Oh, I'm not hearing you anymore, Susan. I, ex I expect you were gonna say, um, we have people on the team who have rich past experience, but not necessarily formal palliative care training. Ah. Oh, now I can hear you. Okay, yeah. so yeah, my connection can be a little sketchy. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So not sure how much of that you got. Just I've had training as an end of life doula. Yeah. And um, so any suggestions on how to, if you have any of entering the field or if there's more training I could have, obviously I'm taking this class, I was very excited um, the topics have been amazing and really helpful at understanding what, you know, um, what y'all do on a daily basis and um, it's very exciting for me. So if there's any suggestions for how to get into this, into this um, aspect or into this career. Yeah, Robin, do you want to take that one? Sure. I mean, I do think, um, you know, the experience you, you bring such rich experience. Um, yeah, I've I worked labor and delivery as well. So um, that's a big, you know, the passion, all that thing that comes, comes into play a lot. I, I'm going to say Vital Talk had the, the most significant impact on my ability to uh, help to train other people and just to have those conversations better. It's such a rich and um, well done program, I would say that the best thing that I did. Excellent. Thank you. And Thanks I don't know. Did you mention, Robin, the um, CSU courses um, and LMEC? Yeah, those were both great. But when I think about what, for, and you know, I guess it kind of just depends, but um, they were both great. LMEC and the um, CCS courses um, were really helpful too. Yeah, and I think I think a lot of palliative care teams train people on the job because um, it's hard to find people that have previous education and training in palliative care. Yeah. Um, what I've, other questions? And I will add one more thing. Vital Talk has typically been structured for providers only, but they're moving towards um, seeing, uh, recognizing uh, not the non-providers. So it's definitely becoming a lot more, um, it's wider. More than, than okay. than. Is that an online course? It can be because it was during COVID and also has been um, in person. And, and where, is that here in Washington state? or is it all over? I'll let you answer that, Sarah. <laughs> oh, well, I, would, I would go to their website, vitaltalk.org and see um, if you can find what courses might be posted okay. there. And then if, if you don't see anything posted, I would just contact them through their website. 
Excellent. Yeah, it is. Um, the, it's it's a, a model train the trainer. So there are people that teach vital talk throughout the country. And I know they did like 75% of their courses online um, this past year because of COVID. So I think that's a model that they're planning to probably continue because it was it worked better than anybody thought. Great. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Oh, and Alice put in the link. Thanks, Alice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for such a great talk. Um, if anyone else has any more questions, feel free to email palcenter at uw.edu and I can direct your message. Um, I'm going to take this opportunity to get your input on um, the palliative care conference we're planning for next year. Um, so I'm going to launch a quick poll. Oh. Do you want me to launch it? <laughs> no, I got it. Oh, you got it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I got it. Thank you. Um, so just given what you know now, um, we're really interested in, in knowing if people would be comfortable attending an in-person conference. We usually have about uh, 375 attendees. Um, and if you have any other comments, feedback, you would like to share about attending a possible in-person conference, I would love to hear from you. You're welcome to uh, either email me at palcenter at uw.edu or message me here. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for your feedback. Um, and I see um, one of our next speakers, Ian Johnson here. Ian, do you know if Michael is going to be joining us shortly? Yeah, he's on his way. Okay. All right. Great. Well, I will leave this poll up for just a few more minutes. And then I will get to um, Ian and Michael's uh, bios. Thank you, everyone. You. Thank you so much. That was uh, very helpful. And I might have to email you more about um, uh, <laughs> setting up some sort of um, really helpful retreat for our palliative care service staff. Awesome. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much for your patience, everyone. Um, so next we have Ian Johnson and Michael Light, both social workers with the University of Washington. Uh, Mr. Johnson is a clinical social worker and doctoral candidate in social work at the University of Washington. His research aims to identify how healthcare and housing systems can better support older adults living outside of traditional housing environments. Ian also teaches at UW's MSW program and co-teaches the Palliative Care Fellowship Seminar.
His most recent practice background is in supporting aging in place and dying in place in supportive housing in New York City and here in Seattle. Mr. Light is a social worker for uh, the Healthcare for the Homeless Palliative Care Outreach Team and for the Emergency Department at Harborview. He earned a master's in social work and in public health from UW. He also teaches advanced healthcare practice for MSW students and is a faculty member with the UW Palliative Care Training Center. Since 2011, Michael has provided clinical and technical support for UW partnerships in Cambodia, focusing on the development of health services, including oncology and palliative care, behavioral health, and social work practice. Welcome, you two. Thanks, Hi there. Thanks for having us, Alice, at all. Uh, I'm just going to congratulate Ian right now on being near the end of his dissertation process as he writes really nice things about our program and our patients. Yeah, cut, cut. Um, thanks so much for being here. I think I am going to be the one sharing slides today uh, for Ian and I. So Ian, you'll just tell me to advance when necessary. And Ian, if you also have the chat up, if someone has a question as we go, um, I think originally we thought we had a little less time for this presentation, so I don't know exactly how timing will fit, but I think what that really also means is that we've got plenty of time for questions as we go. So if you've got something that you feel like you want to say, um, feel free to just type question and can stop us and we can uh, insert. Love to see faces and hear microphones as we go as well. Okay, let me get screen share going. Ian, anything to add before I start? Doing great, thanks. <laughs> great. I don't think we have any sound. And I will come to slide from beginning. Great. So here we are. So the title of our presentation today is Navigating Medical Systems with Unhoused Patients Strategies for Engaging in and Sustaining Care. If anyone has heard uh, me present at this conference before, some things might sound a little bit familiar, but we're going to try and focus a little bit more on context for homelessness today and also some uh, strategies and best practice, things that uh, Ian and I and our team find really important about working with patients without housing, um, particularly in a palliative care context. Um, Ian and I, being both social workers, if there's some social workers on the call with us today, I think it's really important to talk about positionality when we talk about a lot, a lot of this work. Understanding that we have identities and perspectives, things that have shaped our worldview that really influence how we see healthcare, how we see issues of health, um, how we see systems, how we navigate through those systems. It creates both opportunities and limitations in just how we see and understand this work. And we realize that a lot of our patients and every individual has a unique perspectives and experiences that shape that. So we just like to honor that these are some of the ways that our experiences have been shaped. Um, Ian, I don't know if you wanna add anything to, to that comment about positionality. Yeah, just to acknowledge that maybe Michael and I have some kind of unique personal experiences that bring us to this work, but also that we're operating in this work with uh, the understanding that we are um, outsiders to this experience of, um, of homelessness as it's presented most commonly by our patient population. And um, yeah, just to like take that into account as you're being with us today. And that statistically, uh, we and a lot of people who may be on this call today have a lot of demographic differences from our patients who are statistically more likely to experience homelessness. So there's a lot of disparity that we don't necessarily face in the same way. So um, you may have read about our goals uh, prior to attending to the conference, because I think these were uh, circulated as part of the kind of continuing ed prep. <laughs> um, but just to remind everyone uh, what we're here together to do today. Um, we're here really to focus on reducing personal bias and building that resilience or distress tolerance within practice and direct care with patients who are experiencing housing loss or housing stigma. Um, and we want to do that through kind of inviting you into new practice principles um, and strategies for improving patient interactions. And we hope to hear um, about your personal experiences while we do that. Um, and by the end of today, I think we'll all support each other in developing implementation plans for moving this work 
into your settings wherever you are right now. Um, and we can advance to the next slide, I think. So uh, we wanted to start off today with some images that you're probably familiar with as residents of the Pacific Northwest. Um, and whether you encounter these images like in the daily newspaper or in your daily commute, um, these images might conjure a bodily feeling or sensation, a felt experience, a memory, probably a, a collection of those things. And as we're together today for the next like 45 minutes or an hour, I suppose, um, want to be mindful of what comes up for each of us um, and that those experiences can serve as a reminder for our own social location kind of in the um, moral and political and pragmatic debates about homelessness uh, kind of in our present moment. Um, next slide. So before we get into um, content on palliative care, I wanted to start us off by thinking about how we use the word homeless um, to describe a variety of things. Um, so we use the term homelessness um, in our day-to-day -day conversations a lot, again, especially maybe in the Pacific Northwest. Um, homelessness can refer to a physical circumstance. So folks who are living in a place that we might not conventionally deem as appropriate for human habitation, right? Um, like an apartment or a house. Um, and we wanna leave room for our understanding to accommodate a variety of different housing choices, um, many of which are made under constrained choice. Um, and to really consider somebody's individual relationship to their neighborhoods, their communities, and um, their homes or the places that they dwell, right? Um, and so thinking about um, not only our patient's living space, but their relationships to it and their narratives surrounding it. Um, we also use homelessness as a term to describe a healthcare service user in a very specific context, right? So somebody who might be utilizing housing services or has historically utilized um, other residential services or institutional settings like long-term um, long term mental health care, um, jails or prisons, and who are now in the community um, and presenting with a variety of psychosocial barriers. Um, so when we're referencing people experiencing homelessness in our presentation today, we're including folks who are housing precarious or who might be in kind of permanent housing situations, um, but are also included in this wider net, thinking about barriers to care as a result of displacement or forcible uh, containment or dispossession kind of like in the life course, right? Um, and we also use the word homeless or hear the word homeless to as a shorthand word for people who, in, who we encounter in public um, and in our workspaces who have specific appearances and specific behaviors, right? Um, so often behaviors are, or uh, appearances that we find uncomfortable or challenging or morally distressing. Um, and kind of on this broader level, like in the newspapers or in, our, in elections, we talk about homelessness as a policy crisis. Um, so wanting to anchor our perspectives today on that systems level, um, that we're decentering people experiencing homelessness as the crisis or as the problem, right? Um, we're talking about our patients who are also our neighbors um, and who are victimized by racism, um, insuff insufficient response to poverty, and who are kind of a visual representation, representation of our most um, pervasive inequalities. Um, so on this slide are some images put together from media that's been written about Michael's team. Um, we've cropped some of these images just out of respect for patients who are featured in the media, um, but thought it was important to put a face or at least part of a face to some of the folks that we're gonna be talking about today. Um, again, partially because 
we don't feel like we're peer providers in that way. Um, we're not talking to you about our own lived experiences. Um, and to remind us that we're um, talking about people with hopes and dreams and who are deserving of love um, and who are like thinking beyond kind of uh, goals of care and um, in this more comprehensive person-centered way, right? People we care about deeply and can care about deeply in the care that we provide. A lot of love for me looking at this image this way. Um, yeah, and I think I, I've talked about this slide already, but just to, rem to kind of center homelessness as a both a process and a product, right? So um, we know that homelessness is disproportionately experienced by people of color, queer and trans people, disabled people because of cumulative disadvantage. Um, and we also can kind of understand that homelessness is, homelessness is a symptom of larger structural forces, even if individual behaviors that we encounter as healthcare providers like substance use are uh, kind of a catalyst for housing loss or serving to prolong housing loss, right? Um, and those behaviors can also, as much as they are um, maybe challenging for healthcare providers or morally distressing for healthcare providers, um, can also be related to structural inequality, whether it's because they're coping strategies or the result of environmental exposure or behavioral responses to hopelessness. Um, so just a kind of a reminder of the cyclical like trauma of dispossession and displacement um, and how that becomes compounded through um, both like structural forces and these individual or interpersonal level experiences, including folks um, health experiences um, and the loss associated with those kinds of diagnoses um, and lived experiences with um, disablement or disability. I want to highlight on there too, if I can, just for a second, uh, the medical trauma, just to appreciate that there are a lot of reasons our patients engage more often um, and sometimes more seriously with medical services. And a lot of the traumas that they've maybe experienced in the past are re-triggered or reinforced or re-traumatized by their experience in the medical system, both in terms of how we engage with them, but also to appreciate that anyone uh, physically touching our body or taking a scalpel or putting medication in our body can be really a traumatizing experience in, uh, for folks too. So there's a lot of trauma that people have associated specifically with medical environments that come well before our first engagement with them that we can really honor and in that sort of a trauma-informed context think about uh, how are we recognizing those responses how are we working institutionally to, to reduce the risk of re-traumatizing patients yeah so to, to michael's point about like the kind of complexities or intersections of of trauma uh, and health um, we know that both like the experience of becoming homelessness, homeless and the prolonged experience of homelessness and this kind of relationship with institutional uh, kind of healthcare forces in that context um, can create health risks in itself, right? Um, and they can be cumulative and sometimes fatal. Um, so, um, not only do people who are experience, experiencing homelessness face existing comorbidities because of these structural forces, um, but also can have exposure to um, communicable diseases in congregate care, um, difficult getting, difficulty getting rest, ma maintaining medications, um, kind of attending to their own nutrition needs, um, addressing hygiene and staying warm um, or staying cold in uh, difficult weather situations. Um, they're also um, unhoused people are increasingly the victims of hate crimes and can experience um, provoked, unprovoked violence. Um, and we know that because of kind of historical medical institutional trauma and also poor access to the quality healthcare. Um, 
the possibility of recovering from these illnesses or preventing them from kind of stacking on each other um, is less than folks who are in more stable situations. And it's important, I think, to note that the risk of death for people who are living chronically in house is really only moderately affected by substance use or mental illness. So when we talk about risk and we talk about these comorbidities, I think especially in the media and uh, sort of colloquial language, a lot of the things that you hear people talk about are people who use substances and who are homeless, people with mental illness and who are homeless. But when we actually think about what affects people's health and what health risk they have, it's important to remember that those two things are only sort of, those are only some of the modifiers for their health risks uh, and the risk of mortality and morbidity. And with that, when we think about increased uh, risk of mortality and morbidity, we can remember that their patients who are experiencing chronic homelessness have an increased risk of complication, risk and complication of preventable and treatable diseases three to six times the rate of illness, the experience of illness, and four times the rate of hospitalization, three to four times the risk of early death, and have an average age of death, and this sort of varies depending on which study you're looking at, but between 48 and 52. So to think about how all these complex risks actually relates to someone's outcomes, and remembering this average age of death, and look at this 1900 to 1920, and that's actually the years the US white male life expectancy in the United States was about 46 to 54 years old. So people living chronically without housing have about the same life expectancy as an adult white male in the United States 100 years ago. So all of the advances in medical science that we've made in that time are not necessarily reaching, are not actually benefiting some of our patients. They still have the same risk of death as someone 100 years ago. And we think about the one-year surprise question for any uh, palliative care providers in this room that might be familiar with that term, thinking about would we be surprised if this person died in the next year? And using that as sort of a way to, to enter into what palliative care services, we might start to think about whether they're primary palliative care services or specialty palliative care services. When we look at the risk of mortality and morbidity that our patients have, I think it's really important to contextualize that chronic homelessness is a life-threatening condition. And then if we really look honestly at a number of our patients, like we, we might not really be surprised given all the life circumstances that they're facing that they might die earlier from some diseases that someone else with a natural trajectory might have a longer period of life with. So thinking about palliative interventions um, considered as a standard of care, often earlier in care, and remember that there are some of the core pieces like advanced care planning or understanding uh, legal next of kin are important conversation, goals of care conversations are important at a much earlier stage if we're gonna really meet the need of um, people who have traditionally less access to specialty and even primary palliative care services. And with all this, when we think about a context for homelessness, I think it's also really important, again, when we're thinking about systems, to remember that our patients are just um, one level within these multiple systems uh, that impact their, their daily life. And when we think about all of the barriers that they face in accessing healthcare or being able to maintain health uh, that's consistent with their goals, it's, I think, pretty common for us. And when I say us, I mean, sometimes as medical providers, but certainly as a community or a society to think about, we, we talk about patients and their barriers to care. We locate those barriers often at the patient level, their barriers that person faces. When if we really actually explore where those barriers are, we see that they're often somewhere between their connection and relationship with providers, their ability to engage um, or navigate through organizational structures, the availability of community resources and public policy, which often frames the availability of housing, how affordable housing might be, um, what services are available, what services are funded. So a lot of the barriers that people face are not really intrinsic to that individual. They exist within the system. And what that can help us think about too is not just appreciating what the patient is facing, but also thinking about where we're located. Us and our team members, thinking about where within these systems we are and therefore thinking also about where we have the most power to affect some sort of change in our patient's care. And when we think about that, if we kind of cut that down and put ourselves at this interpersonal level, this relationship like with our patients, 
it gives us a chance to think about what, what are the ways in which we can engage and change our engagement practice with our patient, because that's where we functionally have a lot of power to, to change how we're assessing, how we're engaging, how we're providing care for individuals. We also work in the context of organizations. Many of us have more power and uh, more agency within our teams, within our clinics, within our hospital systems or our healthcare systems than our patients often do to try and uh, change policy to make things uh, more accessible, more available, more supportive, more affordable. And even at a community or public policy level, to think about what the, the ways that we can engage on some of those levels that our patients might not really in facing some of the, the daily life burdens that they have to face uh, without having housing that are might be difficult for them to sort of advocate around public policy. What are the ways that we, as healthcare providers, have more leverage in some of those other system spaces? And appreciating that all of that can be really overwhelming. Uh, I don't spend a lot of time doing public policy advocacy. I'm just gonna name that right now. I've got a lot of things to do in my clinical work day to day. So what that means is that, again, coming back to where I have the most space to create change and affect change for my patients and for myself and my own practice is directly in care with my patients and with my team and my immediate clinic. So think about where my power is best located and think about the barriers that my patients face. And I think this concludes kind of this section before I move forward. I wonder if there are things coming up for people or questions I want to create a little space before we just kind of plow through for any questions or maybe even a comment that someone has. Yeah. Feel free to unmute or to use the chat box. We have our eyes on the chat box here in case you're writing us a message. Yeah. Remembering that palliative care providers are comfortable with silence, so I'm going to give a couple seconds longer. All right, we'll keep typing them in if you do have something, like I said, we can uh, pause and come to those at any time. So when we think about that personal locus of control that we have in our patient care, I think it's really important that we spend all the time then talking about like, how do we change our practices in direct patient care to both explore barriers and then create facilitators to help people access care that's important to them. Again, coming to that palliative care principle of goal comforting care, of helping people get the care that is most appropriate, but also meets their needs and meets their goals. So how do we facilitate that by understanding those barriers? And Ian and I thought we would steal a slide from a different presentation that we gave to, to try and give a patient example um, to sort of see really how someone might move through a healthcare system um, who is uh, living with housing insecurity um, and sometimes without a uh, uh, without access to housing, sleeping unhoused, and how they navigate what it means to have serious illness. Um, so this is an example of one of our patients, a 51-year-old woman with a diagnosis of breast cancer. And uh, as we sort of navigate this pathway here, you'll see a number of different um, sort of locations pop up that will name the site where she may have been sleeping at that time, but also the reason that there was a transition. And I think that's the thing that will be important to, to sort of watch or think about is like the, the number of transitions um, that are made from the time of diagnosis, sleeping on the street, being able to access supportive housing, but due to partner violence and safety issues, needing to go to a shelter, going to hospitals or medical respite based on symptom acuity and symptom management, sleeping in multiple different locations in the community because of uh, the acceptability of the location or safety needs, returning to the hospital multiple times for symptom management or functional changes, not being able to stay in a hospital, sort of being in that liminal space between not sick enough for a higher level of care and not, uh, uh, not sick enough to stay in the hospital, uh, not sick enough for not having uh, access to a skilled nursing facility, um, and really kind of being too sick to maybe stay in a shelter, transi transiting through multiple different spaces, ending up at a shelter again for a lower acuity setting with that's acceptable and considered safe by her standards, returning to a hospital for additional symptom management uh, where hospice was initiated, trying to receive hospice services in a shelter setting because again, she didn't have a, a need at that point to stay in a hospital until Ultimately, she did not have the functional ability to remain in the shelter setting and return to a hospital where she died. 
So we can, when we step back and look at this, what I see when I look at this is just the number of different places and appreciating that when you see like a blue hospital that show up, it's not often one hospitalization. That might be, these are the, these are prolonged hospitalizations. There's many ED visits that come within this. There's many short hospital stays. There's some AMA discharges in here as well. Um, when you see that multiple Kate, multiple locations somewhere in the middle of thinking about transitioning between sleeping on the street, sleeping doubled up with someone for a short period of time, uh, a, a boyfriend or a significant other trying to stay in a shelter before there are barriers there. Thinking about the number of transitions that this woman needed to make throughout the course of her care and thinking about the burden of all those transitions and then thinking about all of the gaps that we know that occur um, with each of those transitions. Think about the number of people that are involved in each of these different settings and think about all the unique and specific challenges that each of these settings actually include. This is not a, uh, a simple flow of just moving from place to place. This is a complex set of systems to engage with at each individual stop and try and navigate between. A different slide that I use in a different presentation lays this out as a, as a map and a community appreciation. There's a physical gap between a lot of these physical spaces. So this is a lot to navigate and each step has their own unique barriers. So that's what we're gonna kind of talk about and explore a little bit, help unpack and specify what some of those barriers are and think about what are some of the strategies we can use to help people best engage when I don't have necessarily the power to change this. I, as a provider, did not necessarily have an opportunity to say like, here is your housing. You are now housed. You don't have to have any of these transitions. She was prone to having a lot of these transitions in her care for a lot of different reasons. So how do we help someone navigate through these transitions, uh, appreciating that it's going to be a different journey than if I got a diagnosis of cancer um, with my housing situation and social supports. So this is a little framing context. When we talk about that, ultimately, what our team focuses on is trying to remember that ultimately what we're doing is trying to build trauma-informed relationships. That first and foremost, the quality of our relationships is what's going to help not necessarily her have fewer things to navigate through her journey with this patient, but consistency in a relationship for someone that's able to help her navigate some of those spaces. Um, the, the meaning that comes from being able to establish that relationship and provide some of that continuity and one of the things that we talk about a lot in our team is that our, our sign of success, there's lots of indicators we can use for outcomes for our patients. There are a lot of challenging outcomes for our patients. So when we think about success, what is meaningful for us as providers and, many, uh, and for many of our patients to think about for success. At our first visit, our, our goal is to be invited back for a second visit. Our goal is to meet them where they are, literally and figuratively, understand their goals, understand their priorities, understand their values, all those primary palliative care sort of interventions that we might, that all of us might use in thinking about values, understanding values, understanding personhood, but really focusing on that piece because having a trusted individual that you can help navigate um, through those systems with is, is one of the things that actually facilitated uh, a lot of the, the transitions in our care, allowed us to help support her through many of those transitions. And it's really easy, I think, in healthcare to think about a health need and try and come up with a strategy, an intervention or a strategy that helps meet that health need. And I think what we try to really break down is to understand that health need is existing within the context of a lot of trauma and loss, that someone might have a lot of trauma response that, that might show up in many different ways, including a difficulty engaging, uh, difficulty coping with healthcare environments, different uh, communication abilities with different uh, providers. Um, some people are shut down, some people are very escalated. Uh, so the experience of trauma and loss that they might be going through, as well as these housing other barriers, that creates a complex that we need to understand in the context of their health. So it's not just a health concern, it's not just the cancer that we need to be addressing, it's all of these pieces wrapped up together and before we can really effectively come up with a strategy that's going to work for them, we say in our team that we really need to start with connecting with empathy and connection. We really need to build that relationship to our patient 
And I've got the benefit of being in an outpatient setting that allows me a lot of time and space to do this. I appreciate some other people are gonna be in inpatient settings where they're asked to have a roles of care conversation um, in the moment um, with an acute change. But even that moment, being able to lean in to all the things that might be distressing our patients, the things that I can't change, the things that she can't change, the things that are overwhelming for her often become overwhelming for us. Thinking about all of the all of the barriers uh, that she's going to have to care, being able to lean into that moment and just respond to that emotion, which is another key palliative care skill. But how do we take that a step further with some of our patients and really lean in to the experience they're having and the things and appreciating uh, the system navigation pieces that they're trying to go through and have a hard time changing? Being able to empathize and connect, build that relationship is is what gives us the opportunity to actually come up with strategies that are gonna be most effective for them. Yeah, so Michael's talking about that kind of engagement piece, right? And we don't wanna um, conceptualize um, engagement as something that ends ever in treatment, right? But um, thinking about kind of the next steps um, of that, like assessment period of working with the client um, and thinking about the ways that we're crafting our care plans. I um, think um, working with unhoused folks, um, particularly, you know, in, in other settings that aren't healthcare settings, we hear a lot about harm reduction, right? Um, as, a, as a buzzword, but it's, it's not something that we came up with. Um, it's something that patients do every day to mitigate their own risks in their environment and their unique circumstances and the resources that are available to them. Um, and like with that in consideration, our job is then to adapt care to reduce potential harm in the settings that they live in um, and to create the greatest possible benefit um, within those contexts. Um, again, because as Michael said, like we don't always have the ability, nor do our clients or patients to like affect change there. Um, and these care plans really have to be individualized in accordance with uh, not only patient goals, um, which is something that you're all used to, I'm sure, um, but also with uh, patient circumstances and capacities. So we're shifting from that perspective of maximal care to this point of view that centers kind of optimal care. Um, so what I mean by that, just an example, is um, maybe proactively talking to a patient about their ability or the personal burden of getting to and from the pharmacy, um, resources for storing medications, um, are they kind of, do they have a safe place to put those medications? Are they burying those medications by their tent um, to keep them away from other people? Um, what is their relationship with informal pain management strategies? Um, are they currently using anything for their pain now that they didn't get through a healthcare provider? Um, those kind of things might dictate what you prescribe or the dosage and frequency of what you prescribe, right? Um, so I just, again, talking through um, a care plan that makes sense given people's unique, like, strains in their environment um, and kind of where they find that cost benefit ratio. Um, next slide. Um, again, so when we talk about homelessness, this isn't like a monolithic experience. Um, we know that um, people's sleeping locations really have a huge impact on um, how care is delivered, right? So there are different rules and regulations in these spaces, different policies, and different social norms um, within um, kind of the patient's world. Um, and sometimes those things are not always aligned or simple. Um, so thinking back to the example that we provided a few slides ago of, um, of patient A, um, you know, the shelter was a place that she wanted to return to um, and felt a sense of connection with. Um, and she didn't, um, 
they didn't have a kind of the formal capacity to dispense the medication that she needed or provide assistance with activities of daily living, right? Um, but there was an informal community of people who are also using the shelter who knew the patient and provided informal care. Um, and those are the types of things that allowed her to stay at the shelter longer than she may have originally thought she could, or as her providers, we thought like she could, right? So thinking about not only the, um, the kind of on paper policies of these spaces, but also the social norms that might um, kind of be loopholes in these situations or um, really trying to identify like who are the players in this person's care given where they're located. And if you, a lot of the literature around, uh, literature and practice uh, of working with people who are without housing, asking the assessment question of like, where are you sleeping is incredibly important to give you the context. So like, what are the unique barriers that, that person's gonna face uh, around that particular setting? And appreciate that that might change from the first time you see them to the next time you see them and realizing there needs to be some adjustment because each of these different settings is really gonna have their own unique barriers and facilitators uh, to access and care as Ian said. Yeah, thanks for that segue. Um, I think on the next slide, we have some examples of um, kind of areas of assessment that you might want to consider um, based either on sleeping location or other kind of environmental constraints or experiences that your clients are having, right? And um, this just like speaks to the value of really individualized psychosocial assessment. Um, and thinking about, you know, what are the questions that we typically ask patients and which questions aren't really um, getting to the heart of the needs of patients who are experiencing housing problems um, or who might be living in um, a shelter or in, like an institutional housing setting, right? Um, so those can be anywhere from kind of the, the behavioral health experiences of the client, like any sort of uh, mental health diagnoses or um, kind of identities as psychiatric survivors or anything like that, um, as well as the kind of restrictions or facilitators in particular spaces, right? So um, access to storage, um, access to like meal assistance, um, any sort of building staff, like case man housing case managers, um, or folks that might help with mail or paperwork. Um, uh, also kind of like the financial components of these spaces and patients' relationships with them, right? Um, are they getting kind of uh, dispensable income through their disability check or does the SNP like use all of that money, right? That is coming from disability. Um, we also want to think about the kind of policy restrictions of each of these spaces, right? So if we think about supportive housing, for example, um, I don't I don't think this is true in Washington State anymore, but coming from New York, um, I know that whenever a patient dies in their home in supportive housing, it launches a building audit. Um, so dying in place is really disincentivized. Um, and so thinking about the ways that those policies in those spaces kind of influence the ability of, of people to help the patient in those settings or uh, kind of barriers to enacting your care plan. Um, and again, like I, I think going back to this point of informal care in these settings is really important. And a thing that I've been learning a lot about working with Michael's team um, and just like remembering the ways in which patients receive like social supports in these settings um, that we might not think about. I want to highlight and I appreciate you mentioning that Ian. I think a lot of there is a significant value for people moving into supportive housing when that's something that they want and they feel like they're ready for and is actually available to them. It is not really the same as independent housing. Uh, people uh, HUD does not consider those individuals to be homeless, HRSA does, and they consider them permanently at risk for being homeless. 
And a lot of that is because there are, there are still limitations. There are still a lot of rules and regulations. Uh, often you're receiving um, services in the building, but those services are sometimes also provided by the same organization who is your landlord. Um, so there are still a lot of restrictions and uh, challenges to people trying to receive the care that would be necessary for them, um, especially at end of life, um, to be able to remain in, uh, in those settings as well. So not assuming that just because someone has housing, that where they're housed and how many services and who's providing those services are all significant modifiers to someone's actual access to care or um, availability of facilitators to their care. I think it's also really important to think about barriers by intervention. So a lot of this is thinking if we're talking about uh, harm reduction care planning, it's really thinking about what's the care plan that we think might be like most appropriate for someone's physical conditions, um, but then really trying to tease out and get really specific in our assessment based on like where they're living, what the specific barriers might be, what barriers are buried within our interventions to be able to pick up out their plan and get really specific about what the challenges are going to be to what we think might be sort of the best case scenario or best practice um, sort of approach to their care. So if we if we're looking at the intervention level is thinking for everything that we do for every medication that we want to prescribe, whether it's pain medication or otherwise, for every piece of durable medical equipment, uh, for advanced care planning, uh, healthcare behavior changes, outpatient visits, procedural visits, hospitalization, in-home care, all of these interventions come with their own unique and specific barriers to care. We might not know what all those are. Our patients are often experts in some of those things. Sometimes they are not. Sometimes there's someone else in the system that's gonna be able to help us understand what those are. And it's important that we explore what those are because sometimes we're not gonna find out until like a month or two later when that plan sort of didn't come together. So the better that we can get about getting specific and teasing apart like, okay, here's, here's an option What's going to be hard about that option? What may work, what may not work? Just some like really basic examples, pain medication, depending on where you're sleeping uh, or who the person is. Obviously, I think a lot of people who are prescribing pain medication are aware of like the challenges of trying to uh, manage pain along with someone else's maybe previous tolerance from, uh, from informal access to pain medication um, and interactions of other substances they might be using, but also pharmacy access, safe storage and loss. Uh, one of the examples that, uh, that Ian referenced earlier was a gentleman who was sleeping outside. He was originally sleeping in a uh, sort of encampment that he had built and had access to his chemotherapy medication that he felt like he could keep safe there. That got raised by the city. Um, he was then sleeping under a light rail overpass and his plan with his chemotherapy medication to keep that safe was to keep a couple in a bottle in his backpack so he had access whether he was sleeping there or sleeping on a friend's couch and the rest he would bury in a plastic bag in the ground so that he knew where it was safe. So being able to have that conversation to help him think like, and here are some other options, but that was the option that he felt was gonna work best for him to create the most access, to not worry about uh, needing to come back to the pharmacy on a regular basis. That was the plan that he chose that he thought was gonna work best for him. And of course, cost and coverage. Uh, we have patients right now who are staying in a shelter that are away from the city. Um, they could potentially go to a pharmacy that's closer to them, but they don't have financial assistance through that pharmacy. So they're actually having to come uh, 15 miles by like two different buses to go to a pharmacy where they do actually have coverage for the cost of their medication. So thinking again about each step and where someone's living and how it's gonna change, like what is gonna be the best practice around that plan. And hospice care, we work with some amazing hospice providers here in King County who do a lot to try and meet people where they are and uh, kind of go above and beyond to, to try and meet people where they are physically and, um, and figuratively. Um, but also thinking about does someone actually have a, a location to receive hospice care services um, for any uh, health or community care provider? Is there staff availability and comfort with some of the behaviors that may have communication? A lot of these things end up with a street level bureaucracy of what an individual provider might feel comfortable with and when they choose to continue or stop services. Think about our patients when we think about uh, that patient experience earlier who had multiple visits to a hospital. If you've got a patient who is eligible for hospital services and able to access that somewhere in the community, but also has barriers to being able to call uh, you know, anyone except for 911, um, who might have multiple hospitalizations, who doesn't have a place in their life to put a post, 
so may receive sort of resuscitative uh, services and end up in the hospital. The number of times that they might come on and on, on and off of hospice services is also going to be significant. And sometimes there's maybe a tolerance for how often that might happen before hospice starts to consider whether that's the best plan for a patient. And then, of course, caregiver access. One of the uh, examples, and with this particular patient uh, from our example, thinking about trying to stay in a shelter because that's where someone is most comfortable. But do you have uh, do you have someone to actually help administer um, your opiate medication when you're no longer able to functionally do that for yourself? Do you have someone to help get you to the restroom, even if you're in supportive housing, to help you functionally maintain the uh, end of life stages um, at which someone becomes more vulnerable? Often a lot of our patients, regardless of where they're living, if they don't have in-home in or on-site supports, they do either die of an acute uh, event in the community or also in the hospital, potentially at, a, at another skilled nursing facility or high level of care, which hospice may or may not have access to. Each of these plans, everything we come up with is gonna have some barrier. Trying to tease out what those pieces are is gonna be essential for helping understand uh, how to make a reasonable plan. And so this is where I come to sort of my public health mind and thinking about reality testing. When we think about these on a systemic level, being able to look with our patients, I think part of that relationship building, uh, that trauma-informed relationship building, that cultural humility piece is trying to reduce um, some of the power imbalance in our relationships and meeting our patients as experts in their own care and talking with them to reality test the care plans that we're coming up with and thinking first and foremost, of course, as providers, is this an appropriate plan? Is this an appropriate like medical intervention that we want to offer someone? not just for the medical condition they have, but what we know about them collectively as a person and their health behaviors. What's actually available? We might recommend something that might not realistically be available to them in the community and being really clear about what's available before we're offering a service that's available, especially when I'm sure we've all had providers say like, can't they go to an inpatient hospice facility? And I think many people, uh, hopefully there's some people like snickering at that and appreciating that's, uh, that's not the thing that people necessarily imagine what's truly accessible and not just accessible as in they have doors that open, but truly accessible for the uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria that they might have for a particular patient. Um, the, the challenges in accessing of transporting and getting to a place that's going to be reasonable and attainable for an individual. What's actually gonna be affordable and meet, uh, meet whatever income needs that they have or whatever financial uh, support access that they have. And then above all of it, thinking about what's acceptable. A lot of the examples that Ian was giving and some of the examples that come through um, our patient Jay story is thinking about what is the most acceptable plan to our patients and realizing there's a lot of modulation we need to do to make sure it's something that they feel is right for them. And that's ultimately, that's what goal concordant care is gonna be. It's not just, uh, it meets with some set of values, but it meets with a bunch of competing values often. It meets with, uh, with someone, what they feel is, is best for them in that time, that risk reduction, harm reduction, that's what Ian was saying, that people make these decisions through a complex we all do, or we all make complex decisions about what we think is gonna have the most benefit or the most risk for us all the time. Our patients are just doing that in the context of a lot more variables and sometimes more significant variables than I have to face in my life. So making sure our plans are actually acceptable to our patients is essential to making sure that they're gonna be effective for them. We also think it's really important to maximize, prioritize, and follow up. When I think about that patient's journey through healthcare, um, through the sort of final couple of years of her life, maximizing what we can do when she's in a setting to receive certain types of care. So one of the frequent things that I think about is when someone is hospitalized, what are the things that I can try and help achieve for that patient in terms of assessment, evaluation, imaging, there's a lot of challenges sometimes with what is considered inpatient and what is considered outpatient, but what are the things we can try and achieve when someone is in our space, whether that's in a hospital or in our clinic setting to make sure that we are maximizing the use of that time. If we appreciate how hard it's gonna be once we have a transition of care, 
the number of gaps that we know exist in those transitions, especially for people who have other barriers like communication, maybe literacy, maybe multiple healthcare team members, maybe like nowhere to go, lost paperwork, lost medication. If all those transitions are gonna be prolonged, extended with more barriers, how do we do more things now instead of saying, come back next week? Anytime we say come back next week or call to schedule, call to follow up in one to two weeks, we're creating additional barriers. So anytime we can remove those and do as much as we can while someone's with us is going to improve the outcomes of their care. It's also going to improve, I think, often like their relationship. Again, things that are acceptable to them while they're with us. And being able to prioritize thinking strategically with our patients in that harm reduction sort of framework, like what are the things we're going to prioritize uh, in, in this engagement? And I think from a palliative care perspective, what are the things that someone is maybe suffering from the most? What are the things that they're most distressed about? And how do we help them meet a need related to that? Because ultimately, if we have a list of 10 things that we're going to, to try and recommend, I might, if I was very sick with my access to my husband and family and other social supports in my housing, with my phone, with my computer, have a lot of resources to try and attend to 10 different things. If I don't have some of those resources, it's going to be really hard for me to maybe attend to all of them. So thinking about what are my priorities. And when I think about this, one of the things that I think about a lot is advanced care planning. Um, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in a, a later slide, but thinking also about at, at very least when advanced care planning can be really challenging for our patients thinking about uh, if someone's sleeping in a vehicle or sleeping in a tent that might not have a, a good place for a pulsed form to be hung and seen by a medic, if that's not gonna be necessarily as realistic an intervention um, to inform a medic if someone's found down somewhere, maybe moving to something like advanced care planning or at very least prioritizing that conversation about a DPOA or at very least trying to prioritize that conversation about do you know who your legal next of kin is trying to collect that basic information um, so that we've got something to draw on and have that conversation if there is a serious event later. And follow up, I think close follow up in that same way that maximizing care when we have someone with us, asking for close follow up and trying to, trying to create a system that allows us to have continuity with patients when possible. Again, I appreciate that there's some folks that are gonna be in an inpatient setting here and are not providing continuity after discharge but thinking about who is going to have that continuity. We'll talk a little bit about team members in a minute too, but think about how do we create some opportunity to make sure that patient has support and follow up as well. So what do we do when we're here? How do we prioritize and maximize the time that we have? And how do we ensure some support um, when they do leave our particular setting and invite them and create an opportunity uh, and, and ease of opportunity for them to return to our care? Yeah. And I, I don't know if we have any like administrators in the room or other folks, but we're all a part of um, the healthcare like systems and community, even if we're doing direct practice, right? And so there are ways that we can think about that kind of maximization or prioritization and follow up from an administration level or an organization level, right? Um, and on this slide, we have kind of a checkbox list of um, some of the ways in which barriers come up, like in specific settings, um, you know, hospitals, SNFs, uh, assisted living, agile family homes or group homes, and other kinds of residential treatment, like supportive housing. Um, you know, as as mentioned in previous slides, has um, several types of um, care barriers, and there are ways to think about like how are we working to align our institutional capacities with this idea of acceptable goals of care for our patients who experience housing precarity or homelessness? How are we thinking about maximizing health access in these settings, right? How are we promoting the idea of self-determination or patient agency in our settings with patients who have had a long life of restricted options um, and um, specifically in, in health and mental health care. Um, so yeah, thinking about all these variables like admission criteria or, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking specifically of an example of how folks with criminal histories or folks who are 
actively on methadone or Suboxone. Um, those are two specific barriers to a lot of residential care sp spaces. Um, and it requires, you know, some um, finesse and forethought to get people in a place where they can be eligible for those spaces. Um, and some of those restrictions on an organization or administration level, like don't necessarily serve a, like a known function, right? Um, so thinking about the ways that we can like address this on a, an organization policy level as well. I think, and part of that, and thinking about these transitions between these spaces is being really thoughtful about who are the members of our care team. And I think it's important to talk about this from the perspective of us and our well being, and also the care of our patients. Thinking about when we have this level of complexity, who are the members of our care team that really, and this is clearly a plug for social work, but like making, making sure we have uh, a care team that uh, can really respond to some of the multiple needs that our patients have. Uh, we look at the sort of like eight domains of palliative care, and there are some of them that are really focused on process of care and are on uh, the physical needs of care, but there's a lot that's focused on psychosocial. And we're talking about really complex psychosocial situations, being really thoughtful about like who are the people we can engage with in our teams to help reduce our burden and also share, distribute some of the moral distress that we often feel when caring for people where we want to do what feels like the right thing or the best thing. And that's not necessarily an option or it's not necessarily really the best thing. It's not the optimal thing. It's just our idea of the best thing. How do we share some of those experiences with the people that we work with to kind of diffuse some of that experience, to be able to learn to lean in and not bring those things to our patient situations, um, to our patient care. Um, and also thinking really creatively about the teams that exist outside of our team and thinking about who is really in the life of, um, of our patient. And I think for some of our patients, we really think about who is your family, who are your close friends, who are your loved ones, who's gonna be at bedside. And I think it can be a little bit more complicated and a little bit more broad. And it, there are people that we don't typically include in healthcare discussions that are sometimes really meaningful to engage in healthcare, um, engage in our planning with patients. So when I think about some of the barriers that people face in care support, sometimes those are natural supports, the friends, the family, the close loved ones. For some of our patients, uh, those people might also be without housing, which means they are facing a lot of burdens on a daily basis themselves that might make them less available or less reliable supports. Um, they may have complex health issues as well. So think about the experience of trauma or the health risks that they might be exposed to similarly to our patients. They have a lot of maybe history of trauma and loss themselves. And of course, they might not exist. Some of our patients really don't have people that they feel like they've been close to or they feel like they trust or can rely on for some of the things that we would think of a natural caregiver support to actually provide some of that attending to, uh, to an appointment. Um, I, picking up medication, providing, uh, you know, dispensing medication, providing with uh, bathing support in your home. So being able to acknowledge some of the burden that the people who may be involved, the natural supports who are involved, acknowledging the burdens and addressing their complex needs as well, attending to their complex grief, especially if it's triggering a lot of other loss that they may have experienced. Um, and also really thinking about realistic availability and reliability for creating a care plan that involves these natural supports being really thoughtful about what's the realistic availability and reliability of those individuals. And then also think about where can we expand care supports, whether they're natural or whether they are paid caregiver supports, like how can we help uh, increase that circle for someone who might need it, where they're able, where they want to. And also the sort of uh, non-traditional engagement that we might have with professional supports. I think we do often a really great job in healthcare of like, maybe it's time to engage the PCP and the nephrologist, the oncologist and getting a care conference together and including those individuals. When really for a lot of our patients, there's a lot of other professional supports might be shelter staff, housing case managers, paid caregivers, people that are gonna have actually more knowledge uh, about a, an individual's life circumstances, barriers and facilitators, facilitators to care, the um, parameters of a housing situation, the parameters of a shelter that might have a lot of knowledge, maybe more than anyone uh, in their personal life, maybe more than a sibling they haven't talked to in 20 years about their values, about their hopes, about their wants, about the, their needs, about who they are and their personhood. 
And that those individuals often also are in situations, you know, where maybe you're in a somewhat low paid job that you are, you have a large caseload of people in say a supportive housing unit who all have a lot of complex needs. And now you're facing uh, supporting someone with end of life and complex existential distress and complex health needs and a lot of medical appointments you're trying to arrange transportation to. And maybe you're being asked by staff, like, can you start giving them medication? Can you be the one to dispense it? Can you be the one to hold their opiates? Uh, things that sort of get into an area like, what is the scope of practice? So thinking about like, what are the burdens that are maybe befalling them as well? How do we learn from them and how do we support them as well? So being first and foremost, able to address safety concerns and learn from them what safety concerns might exist and also supporting and understanding what safety concerns we need to think about for those caregivers. Where is someone sort of maybe pushing the envelope because they love and care about someone and they wanna support them in the space that they're in? And when do we help them understand what is an appropriate time to sort of set a safety boundary for everyone involved, our patients in particular, other people in the shelter, other staff members, when do we also include them in care planning, given the unique knowledge that they have? How do we bolster the resources and intend to grief that they might be experiencing too? A lot of the supportive housing units, when there is a death of one of their residents, shelter is sometimes the same, they have memorials. These are people, these are people who have homes. These are people who have place, a sense of community, who have neighbors. These are not people often without people and no sense of place who are completely displaced in a community. These are people who often have some connection, attending to the meaning that exists in those relationships for our patients and those caregivers is incredibly important and meaningful for us. I also think it's important that we think about looking to the future and honest, honoring legacy. Um, I think these are our last couple of slides. <laughs> When I think about this, one of the things that I have to do often in my practice is being able to step back and think about how often we find ourselves attending to a crisis and attending to a crisis point. And if we think about that patient and her trajectory through care, there are lots of different crisis points. And this is a woman who lived often in a state of crisis. She had a hard time coping with that crisis. There were a lot of challenges that she faced day to day. There were a lot of things that we needed to attend to as she moved through that process. Being able to stop and step back and still think about, not just in terms of prognosis, where is this going, but in terms of like the, the many complex uh, psychosocial issues that she was experiencing, the, the barriers within the care system, being able to see the weight, the velocity of, of all of that as it's like moving towards this current crisis, but being able to project out where is this really going and being able to step back and say like, we're attending to this crisis now, but we still need to stop and take a moment to help prepare and plan for the future. And uh, I think some of that is really as simple as being able to think about advanced care planning when we've got limited amount of time and we're thinking about interventions and we're thinking about trying to attend to a crisis being able to not only uh, say like, what are we gonna do in the future? Who do we need to involve? How do we need to plan for this? How can we be realistic, just knowing what we know of all of these barriers and things we can and cannot change, knowing where this is going. There's uh, a lot of times we get referrals with a, a lot of hope. Can you get this person housing so that they can stay housed, they get hospice so they can die in home with hospice? None of those things are likely things that I can do. There are, a lot of, uh, there are a lot of things I just don't have power around. What I can do is help everyone prepare. Like realistically, we're probably working towards someone ending up with a prolonged hospitalization, dying in the hospital um, or dying in a skilled nursing facility. How do, we, how do we plan for what that looks like and think about who we need to involve and what things we need to set up and how we support a care team and thinking about that trajectory, knowing that that's gonna be often a lot of inpatient providers having those conversations, not home care and hospice providers having some of those planning conversations. And honoring legacy, I think we tend to think about people who have experienced so much loss in so many other ways, uh, loss of identity, loss of place, lots of, um, community, lots of family, uh, as people who have maybe nothing left to lose and sometimes also nothing left to share and give. And while our patients may not sometimes have legacy items that they're not going to sit down and maybe make a scrapbook, there are still a lot of things that they maybe want to pass along and share with members of their community. There are lots of things, conversations that they want to have with people. Um, there are maybe 
uh, special items they do want to pass along, whether it's art, whether it's a sense of self, whether it's writing uh, their own obituary or eulogy. There are ways that people still want to think about their legacy and how that they're remembered, even if there's not as many people um, that they have close relationships to remember them. And that's really complicated for people and giving some space outside of just the crisis to think about where this is going to give people a reminder and give people some space to hold and say, how do you want to be spending this time? What else is important to you? Because we can think about this, and I think this is a pretty common, again, in the world of palliative care, we think about like palliative care interventions start at the point of diagnosis and like go through the point of death and maybe you get cured, but like through the changes in health and functioning or the increase in disease and disability, like maybe palliative care takes a, a more substantial role and we stop taking about, uh, talking about uh, curative care. We start talking about the different palliative interventions and how those might change over time based on health and disease, functioning disability. It's also stepping back and saying that over that course of time, when we think about this patient, we can expect that this context is gonna change. We're gonna need to modify based on the psychosocial settings, the psychosocial context and the setting context, what our interventions are gonna be. So I appreciate we can plan for the future and know that we're gonna to need to adjust those plans often frequently. So I think we, we have about uh, 10 or 11 minutes left in our, our time together. Is that, that's correct, right? Um, you guys are actually out of time, but um... Uh, so just try to finish up and, uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, so, uh, since we're finished, uh, finished up with our time, uh, we kind of wanted to leave you with these questions and, um, certainly welcome you to reach out to either of us or both of us, um, via email. Um, but yeah, hoping that these questions, um, will kind of prompt you to, take what was in the presentation today and, and run with it in your practice. Um, something that you can do to enhance your care, um, something that you have questions or curiosities about still, um, and, and things that resonated with you in your, in your heart and in your soul. Um, so feel free to, to contact us and share any of that if you wish. And um, thanks for being with us today. Yeah. And our team's also likewise available for consults. So we see patients that are within uh, the Seattle area living uh, unhoused or in permanent supportive housing. We are happy to talk about referrals. We're also just happy to talk about uh, patient care and things that um, from our experience, we might be able to help support a team with. Ian, were there a couple of things in chat? I think just Alice's links for the course evaluation, if you could fill that out for us. And then also if you're interested in signing up to become a member of the Canvas Center. Yep. Yeah. And uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute yourselves and ask them. Um, it sounds like Michael and Ian have a few minutes still. Yeah. Happy to stick around. And thanks for everyone who joined today. Appreciate the work that you do every day. Sincerely. Uh, the question about the recording. So as soon as I get it uploaded to YouTube, I will post it. Um, I will be sending the link to the recording and the course evaluation again to everyone who's registered. Thanks. Alex. Later today. Mr. Schubert, did you I say a camera on? Did you have a question? Michael and Ian know just a big thank you in this world of inequality. Um, the work that you guys are doing is just way up there. I have such a high respect for you both. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you very much. Appreciate that. I get a lot of, uh, I've had a lot of meaningful relationships that come from this work. So I feel like I benefit deeply from it. Thank you though. You're welcome. There's some other. Oh, I just wanted to, answer um, somebody's question in the chat about how to reach us. So I just put our both of our emails in the chat if you're interested in reaching out. I think they're also on the slide deck, maybe on that second slide. Yeah, slide two. 
And um, if you guys want the participants to have access to the slides, uh, feel free to send it to me. I can convert it to PDF so your notes um, aren't visible. I'll send you a PDF copy. Sounds great. Thanks, Alice. Yep. And one last thing I wanted to share was um, if you are with UW Medicine, we have a lot of resources available for physicians, nurses, social workers, case managers um, at all four UW Medicine uh, sites. Um, and these, avail uh, these resources are available through CAPSI. I've dropped the link in the chat box. Um, the CAPSI membership is partially sponsored by Cambia Health Solutions. Um, so yes, um, thank you so much. Thank you, Michael and Ian for your great talk. Very inspiring. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again next Friday. Again.